Okay, thanks very much for the introduction. Uh, and it's, it's a great pleasure and honor to, to be giving this talk for the Simons Collaboration. Um, my talk will be mostly based, based on an article which appeared on the archive under the identifier that you can read at the, at the bottom of the, of the page. And okay, so let's, let's get started. Um, yeah, the, the main motivation behind, behind my work uh, is, is, to, is, to, is to try to understand as, 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 as well as possible the analytic origin of the, of the optimal bootstrap constraints on the low-length CFD data. So, of course, by now we have accumulated a huge amount of amazing numerical results, the most prominent one being the free uh, concerning the three-dimensional Ising model. But I think it is fair to say that uh, we do not really have a, have a deep physical understanding of the precise location of the bounds or the, this precise mechanism of, the, of what confirm bootstrap equations are trying to do. So, of course, it would be wonderful if, if one day we could, we could, just, we could use the, the bootstrap equations to, to find the precise location of the, of the kink or various other features in, in the bootstrap bounds. So I hope that, that my work uh, is, is a, at least a small step in this, in this direction. And then uh, another question is that uh, we might wonder what are, or another question which I, which I would like to, to some extent address in my talk is, uh, what are the consequences of, of a crossing in a conformal field theory on the boundary to, to the properties of scattering of massive particles in the, in the ADS space, in, in, the, in, the, in the bulk ADS? Um, so it, it will turn out as a, as a byproduct of the analysis leading to, uh, related to the first question. I'll be able to say something interesting about this, uh, specifically by, by looking at the, at the 1D, 1D CFT crossing equation in the limit when, when both the external scaling dimensions and the internal scaling dimensions are large. So what, what, do, we, what do we already know about the, the optimal, about the origin of the optimal bootstrap bounds? Well, it's, it seems likely that, uh, that the, the optimal bounds coming from bootstrap are, are, come from some intricate combination of, of the of constraints both from the Lorentzian and Euclidean signature, uh, the former. So the, the Lorentzian constraints can be can be solved analytically, systematically in the in the so-called double light cone limit, uh, which has been achieved by by a number of authors. Uh, I will not have much to say about this, unfortunately, but I, I think it, it is possible that there are some there are some interesting interplays uh, with, with what I'm going to talk about uh, in my talk. But the, the point of view of my talk is, is more is slightly more pragmatic, let's say, uh, and it is that the, the, optimal, the optimal constraints from bootstrap are real equivalent to the existence of the so-called extreme functionals, which are some uh, inner functionals acting on, the, acting on the crossing equation, which I'm sure all of, all of you know very well. So sort of the, the slogan of my talk is that uh, any, an analytic understanding of the bootstrap bounds should come from from some analytic understanding or analytic constructions of the corresponding extremal functionals. So this, this is sort of the, the, main, the main goal of my talk. Where I'm going to introduce a new class of, of, of functionals and use it to construct some extremal functionals for, for the simplest bootstrap bounds. So eventually we would like to understand what happens in, in, in more than two dimensions, especially three dimension is the, is the case that I already mentioned, but there the conform blocks are, are very simple, uh, sorry, are, very, are very, very complicated and the, the progress might be, might be much harder than in lower dimensions, so, but already, already in, in 2D, uh, the, uh, we, have, we have quite little understanding of, of the origin of the, of e even of the scalar bound uh, here, here, on the, here on the right. And there the control blocks are much simpler, but these two, these, these two don't really know how, to, how the bound arises. So it's possible to simplify the problem even further to, to one dimension. Um, where it turns out that the, the, bound, the bound is just a straight line, but, but in my opinion, there is, there is quite a strong, there, there, is, a, there, is, a good, there is a good hope that the, the results can be lifted to, to two dimensions because the, the one-dimensional conformal block, this function k, is, well, is, is just the chiral half of the two-dimensional conformal block. So, so, so my talk is going to going to be entirely about, about 1D, but I think the lift to 2D should not be too, too difficult. Okay, so he, here is a summary of the, of the results and sort of a, a quick outline of my talk. So in, in the first half, I'm going to, I'm going to show that uh, the optimal upper bound on the gap in the OPE of two, of two primaries, uh, Psi and Psi, in a, in a unitary one-dimensional conformal field theory is, uh, is 2 delta Psi plus 1. 
at least for at least in the case when two dot psi is an arbitrary positive integer. And I'm going to do this by constructing the, the optimal extrema function analytically. So in order to do this, I will have to introduce a, a new basis for the extrema functionals, but uh, let's wait for that. Uh, and I also showed in my paper that this could be lifted to 2D to get a to get an exact bound on the twist, but I don't think I'll have time to, to talk about it in my, in my talk today. And in the second half of the talk, I will I will, I will show that these, these extremal functionals, which, which, I, which I think in, in, in the view of many people are just some obnoxious numerical tools, actually acquire a very, very interesting physical meaning when, when the scaling dimension of the external operator is large. So in, in this case, these extremal functionals simplify and they can be used to recover the properties of, of massive quantum view theories placed in, in large ADS2 uh, from boundary crossing. So in particular, the, the, proper, the, the properties of, of uh, QFT in, in large ADS2 that, we'll be able, that I'll be able to recover from, from the application of these functionals are exponential suppression of OP coefficients coming from bound states, as well as the analysis of, of the flat spaces matrix. Okay, so let's, let's, get, let's get down to business, unless, unless, there, uh, unless there are any questions about, about the outline. I'm not sure how, how questions will really work, if, if I can hear everybody or not. Okay, okay. No, we can hear you well. Okay, sorry. Okay, is there, is there any questions on your point of view? Feel free to interrupt me. Uh, okay, so let's, okay, let's so get so going so with the setting of the problem. Uh, the basic setting is going to be conformal bootstrap in a, in a 1D CFT. So let's uh, let's take a four point function of primary operator operator psi. It has this form. Uh, we'll be always in the regime where the, the unique conformal cross ratio z is, is between well is between zero and one, or at least th th this is the this is the physical regime where z is between zero and one. And then the the conformal the conformal invariant part of the four point function can be expanded using the OP into conformal blocks. Conformal blocks are this, this capital G. And they take a very simple form, as a z to the delta times a hypergeometric, which is definitely familiar, familiar to you as the, as the chiral block uh, in two dimension. And then, then the, the crossing equation is, is written here in, in blue, is just a sum with the OP coefficient squared times the, these vectors or functions uh, in red, the capital F, and the, the whole sum, sum is equal to zero, where the the elementary vectors entering the crossing equation are just an anti-symmetric combination of the of the direct channel and cross channel conformal block. So, so these these two lines are are the equations that we are going to study for the rest of the talk. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can I can hear somebody maybe is trying to ask a question, but it's not very I can hear very clearly. Oh, somehow, oh, somehow we are just. I, I can't. I can't hear very well. Sorry, I, I heard a few words, but then then the connection dropped. We can't see your slides. You you cannot see my slides. Uh, I can't. Oh, I think I'm. Sh so I, I'm still. I'm still. Thirty seconds ago. I, no, I'm the still, slides I'm still, are I'm, there. I'm showing my slides. Uh, can uh, is there anybody else who who doesn't see my slides? No, also, I, I don't see them either. Mm -hmm. Well, I can I can try to stop sharing them and then start sharing them again. Yeah. No, I think you just have to click on them. Yeah. There. Are they Are they back up? Yes. Okay. So if it if it happens again to anybody, then let me know and I'll, I'll repeat this procedure. Or can everybody Can everybody see my slides now? Yes. I still cannot see them, but maybe it's my fault. Hmm. Shall I wait or shall I keep going? Okay, go okay. ahead. If I'm the only one. I think I think if if I can say something, you know, people who who don't see the slides should probably log out and then reconnect and then hopefully they will see them. But most of us see the slides, so okay, good. Yeah. Okay, so um, I, I'll keep going. Then uh, you, the, the first thing you may wonder is that what happens when you try to do numerics. The, the usual numerical bootstrap for the for the, the equation, and we, we did it with Davida and Miguel in our paper in, in t from 2013, and it, it looks like the the numerical bootstrap bound on the gap converges to two, two delta psi plus one, 
So the, the red dashed line in the plot on the right is two delta psi plus one, and the black dots correspond to the numerical bound. Um, still not the optimal one. But, uh, it looked like uh, things were converging down to two delta psi plus one. And in fact, you can see easily that the, the bound cannot be lower than this value, two delta psi plus one, because there is an explicit solution to the crossing with that gap. The solution to crossing corresponds to the free real fermion in ADS2, uh, where the, the four-point function takes this form with three, three terms, just three different weak contractions. And the, the operators in the psi and psi OP are just identity, and then all the two particle states, which are just, well, in the operator language, they are just two psi's with an, with an odd number of anti-symmetrized derivatives acting on them. So we know that the, the bound can certainly not be lower than two delta psi plus one because of this activated solution. And maybe we would like to show that the bound is also, is also not about it, that there is no, there is no solution with a, with a gap bigger than two delta psi plus one. Now, in order to do that, it, it is sufficient to construct an, an extreme of functional, which takes the, the following form. Uh, so we, we need a functional omega acting on the conformal blocks such that it has a, it has a simple, simple zero at two delta psi plus one. And then uh, we, we know that the functional must un annihilate the whole, the whole spectrum and it, it must be positive above two delta psi plus one. So this means that uh, there, are, there, there, there are even order, but presumably second order zeros at at all the values to load up psi plus three, to load up psi plus five, et cetera, et cetera. And, and this is indeed with what, uh, what I'll show, show how to do in the, in the remaining part of, well, in, in, a part, in the following part of, of my talk. So, re, uh, so really by, by constructing such a functional, uh, we can prove that the optimal bootstrap bound is precisely to load up psi plus one. You can, you can already wonder what the numerical bootstrap can tell us about the, about the nature of this extreme of functional. And in fact, uh, you, you, one can come to the conclusion that the optimal extreme of functional living right on the bound cannot be written in the basis of Z derivatives. The reason, the reason is that as we increase the, the N max, the, the total number of derivatives used, and we approach the, the optimal bound, uh, the, the ratio of the of the consecutive coefficients goes to infinity. So these coefficients b, b j, uh, where the index j labels the, the order of the derivative. Um, when we look at the ratio of the, of the two consecutive ones, it goes to infinity. So there is really no way that the optimal functional can be written in this basis. Now what, what this is trying to tell us, what, what is it related to is that if we expand the, these, these cross conformal blocks, or perhaps I'm, I'm just going to call the, the vectors entering the conformal bootstrap equation as, as conformal blocks, these functions f. So we know that the, as a function of, of, of the complex variable z, the, the blocks have a, have a pair of branch cuts, one starting at z equal one and going to infinity, one starting at z equal zero and going to minus infinity, and the bootstrap equation converges everywhere in the, in the plane except for the, except for the branch cuts, away from the branch cuts. However, when we expand the, the blocks around z equal to one half uh, in a Taylor series or using derivatives at that point, we can, we can only ever have access to information about this fun these functions f in the radius of convergence, which only has radius one half. So we, m we may well be missing some, some important information uh, located outside of the radius of convergence. And this is exactly what the result tells us. So it seems that, it seems that the optimal function wants to see outside of the radius, radius of convergence. Uh, now, indication of a similar behavior appeared in, appeared, appeared in, a, in a recent paper by, by David Simmons Duffin, where, where he showed that, at least in three dimensions, the, the optimal functional uh, likely probes the, the light cone limit. So this, this, this is really the fact that the functional wants to see all the way to z equal one or all the way to z equal zero is, is an indication of a similar behavior as I just described in, in 1D. But I, I don't, I don't understand the precise quantitative relationship. Uh, uh, question? Uh, yep. So if you used the Q variable instead of the Z variable, do you expect uh, you will be able to write in terms of the derivatives? Sorry, uh, can, you, can you repeat the question? It was a bit... Um, okay. okay. So if you used the Q variable instead of the Z variable, mm -hmm. then you will not have this problem of radius of convergence? Uh, then so you, you may be able to. 
uh, are you are, are you referring to, to 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 the to the row variable? I'm, I'm not sure if uh, I, the I understand the, the, Q, Q, the Q variable. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not not sure, not sure how the Q variable is defined. I I'm familiar with the row variable, but anyway, I, it's, it's it is it is indeed it is possible to to define a variable, which which covers the which which basically maps the whole plane without the two cuts into into the interior of unit disk, and then you do not have this yeah. problem. Yeah. So it, it is it is indeed possible to to construct such variables. And then, then things converge, and that, that's perfectly fine. But it's it's a bit it's a bit difficult to try to fix the precise extremal function in that basis. I'm going to take a slightly different viewpoint, in and in that language, it's possible to fix the function more efficiently or, or analytically. All right. Okay, and uh, so the, this viewpoint that I just mentioned is going to be try to think of the function as a, as a contour integral. So if so, we we. It, it seems that the function wants to wants to know about values of the functions f anywhere in the in the plane without the two cuts. So let's let's first let's first rewrite the the value of the function somewhere in the plane as a contour integral. So it's it's easy to do it using using Cauchy's theorem. But of course, in the in the in the situation, the, the the location of the contour depends on the location on the location of the point. So we would like to we would like to have some we we'll have to have a description of, the of these functionals without, uh, uh, at least, uh, sorry, where the contour doesn't depend on the precise location of the point. So the the way to do this is to is to, is to uh, use the holomorphicity of the of the function f and pull the contour to, to the to the branch cuts or to this contour gamma, where we we use two important we use two properties of the function f. So first of all, we use the 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 fact that f is is odd under the crossing as the, in the first line to to get rid of the the contour on the left, so we, we mapped everything to the right, and we also use the use the fact that uh, the function is bounded as as e goes to infinity, so that so that the pulling of the contour can be done and there is no contribution at infinity. So so then the value of f at z zero can be written as this contour integral in the upper right hand corner, and now the contour gamma doesn't depend on the location of the point. Okay, but the the, the most general functional, which depends on on the values of the function in a, in a certain compact region, uh, can, can then be thought of in, in this way. We just need to generalize a little bit, and the only thing that we need to generalize is this is this integral kernel. So uh, I call it G. So okay, so we generalize uh, we generalize the functional to depend on the values of the function f of z, uh, where z zero lies in some compact region. So we have a function omega which maps f to this contour integral, where contour gamma is shown in the upper right-hand picture, and uh, the, the contour the, the integral kernel of g is is now more general, reflecting the fact that the function may depend on on the value at various points, but it still needs to satisfy some properties. So it follows from the from the fact that the functions on which we act are odd under the crossing, that the, the kernel should be even under the crossing, and it follows from the fact that uh, the function should, should not depend on behavior at for the function f at infinity that g must decay sufficiently fast. So in particular, g must must decay at least as fast as e to the minus two when, when z goes to infinity. So the, the the reason the specific reason for this is that the the point at infinity or sorry that the 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 expansion into conformal blocks does not does not converge on the branch cuts and in particular it doesn't converge at z equal to infinity. So we, we need to make sure that that our functional does not depend on the behavior of the of the conform blocks or the correlator at, at infinity. So this, this is the reason for for this is why it needs to this is why G needs to decay sufficiently fast. Now uh, our our task is to fix is to fix the G so that we, we obtain the correct extremal functional. Uh, in order to do that, it's first it's first useful to go through a couple of steps. So uh, the, the first step that simplifies the analysis is to map is to map the branch cut uh, to to the unit interval. So we perform a conformal transformation where we map uh, the z variable to the x where we, we map to the x variable uh, by x equals z minus one divided by z. So this maps the branch cut between one and infinity to the interval between zero and one. And it maps the contour to the to the contour shown on the right. 
And we also re-express the integral kernel g in the z variable in terms of a new function h. h. H is now a function of x with some, some prefactor. The, the prefactor is there just to, to simplify the notation uh, so that when the dust settles, the, the, original, the original function of omega is defined as follows. It maps f to this contour integral in the x-plane around contour gamma, where the integral kernel is just 1 minus x to some power times times the kernel h of x. And the, the original properties of that the kernel g must satisfy map to certain properties that h must satisfy. So for example, crossing maps to x goes to 1 over x. So h should, h should be invariant under that. And uh, the fact that g decays at infinity maps into a sufficiently soft behavior of h as x approaches 1. So in particular, h must decay like 1 minus x to the power 2 delta psi as x approaches 1. Now, the next, next step, uh, next step that, that, uh, that, that facilitates the, the, the road towards the, the extreme of, uh, to, towards obtaining the extreme of functionalist is to expand h in a complete basis. So that there is a very natural, a very natural basis of functions to expand h in, namely, the eigenfunctions of the conformal Casimir. In particular, those which are which are regular at the endpoints of the branch cut. So there, there, are, there, there is a nice set of eigenfunctions of the conformal Casimir, this, this set P, Pn of x, uh, which are, uh, which can be written as hypergeometric functions. And uh, they really are just Legendre polynomials. So H, H can be expanded with coefficients a n uh, in this basis. One problem with this basis, it, it, it breaks the crossing. So the, the conformal Casimir equation in the direct channel is not the same as the conformal Casimir equation in the cross channel. So, uh, and of course, if we expand something in polynomials, we cannot, it, it's hard to impose invariance under x goes to 1 over x because no, no polynomial will ever be invariant under, under this transformation. But nevertheless, uh, we, we, we will not worry about this for the time being and we'll just uh, forget about the restriction that h should be in one variant under x goes to 1 over x. Can I, uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Actually, I don't understand this phrase that h of x should satisfy this mm. crossing constraint. I mean, you are perfectly free to consider h's which do not satisfy this constraint. It's just they give you a redundant set of functionals. Yeah, mm. I, I, think, I, think that's, I think that's true, yeah. Yeah, I, I haven't I haven't thought about this this symmetry very carefully, but I, I think what, what Slava is saying is true that uh, that any that any function h which is anti-symmetric, well, any any function can be decomposed into a symmetric anti-symmetric part, and the anti-symmetric part will probably not contribute will not contribute to the action of the function. I haven't checked this, but it it sounds plausible. And anyway, the the point is that that in the end the, the, these coefficients. A n the basis can be fixed uniquely to, to give us the correct extrema function, which is what I'm going to do soon. Uh, so now, now the first thing that we should understand is, is how, the, how the elementary basis functionals uh, act. So by, by, basi by basis, func basis function, I, I will denote as omega n, and it's, it is precisely the function where h of x is one of these basis functions p n, p n of x. Uh, we want to act with these functionals on the on the vectors or functions appearing in the bootstrap equation. So let's recall that the function receives a contribution from the direct channel, that's the that's the blue part, and the contribution from the cross channel, that's the red part. And it's it's actually it's possible to to find the action of the basis functionals on on the conformal blocks explicitly. The action on the on the direct channel, written in blue, is, is simpler because both the direct channel conformal block and the and the function p n are are eigen functions of the same Casimir equation. And then the the action on the cross block is a bit more complicated. It involves this function r, which uh, which includes some, some messy messy, hyper, messy hypergeometric function for a three, but we don't really have to have to worry about that right now. Uh, an important point is that both the action on the direct and cross, cross part include these oscillating, oscillating factors. 
and these, these oscillating factors are going to be very, very useful to, to obtain the, the typical oscillatory behavior of the extremal functions, where the, the, the function oscillates and has double zeros at, at the spectrum. So these, the, these, these oscillating factors are really the origin of the oscillatory behavior of the function. Can I make a comment about uh, the, yep. these expressions? Um, so for, for those of you who uh, are familiar with the Hungarian approach to the conformal bootstrap, um, I, this is these notes. Um, uh, Balt gave a talk about um, self-adjointness for uh, SL2 conformal blocks several years ago at Perimeter. Um, and I think uh, the PNs that you have are precisely this, they're, they're, they're a combination of a block and a shadow block. And mm -hmm. when you integrate those against the block in one channel, you get just a pole at the, at the dimension of the block. Mm -hmm. So you can see that the first term has a pole at delta equals n, and then a pole at the shadow, one mm -hmm. minus n. And then the second term is the crossing kernel for SL2 blocks, um, which is uh, famously a 4F3 hypergeometric function. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, okay. So. I, was, I was not aware of that. Thank, thank you. Why is it called Hungarian approach? I think they just called it that. Or Bulgarian? I, I don't remember. <laughs> Maybe Bulgarian. Leonardo knows? Bulgarian. Okay, thanks. Thank, thanks for the illuminating comment. It's I should look into it better. Um, okay, so now that um, now, now that we see see how the action works, uh, it it will it will be useful or actually necessary for my approach to specialize to to the case when these oscillating factors are in phase as a function of delta. So this happens precisely when two delta psi is a is a positive integer, or an, an integer, but delta psi should be positive uh, by unitarity. So, uh, in the rest of the talk, I'm going to specialize to the case when two delta psi is a is a positive integer. So, as I already said, in that case, the, the oscillating factors are in phase. We can take them out, and then in the curly bracket, we just have this this rational this simple rational function and the and the function r, which is related to the crossing kernel. And important observation is that the, the function r as a function of delta has no singularities for delta greater than 2 delta psi minus 1. So the only, sing the only pole or singularity in the curly bracket uh, in, in the region above 2, delta, uh, above 2 delta psi minus 1 can come from the first, the, the, the blue term. Um, so uh, from this, it, it follows that that the, this, the set of omega omega n's are are, as, are 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 precisely dual to the to the set of conformal blocks f of m for integer m at least in the in the region where m is greater than two delta psi in the in the following sense we have this it is orthogonality that when we act with omega n on an integer value conformal block uh, we just get a Kronecker delta with some positive prefactor. So th this this relation this relation will allow uh, allows us allows us to to pick out the the op coefficient uh, from the from the crossing equation by acting on it with, with omega n at least up, up to up to some caveats but only in the cases when the whole when the whole spectrum of it's kinds of integers and I'm going to show in a second uh, so another another observation that we can make is that we can can that the, the action of the basis function omega n on the identity block can be evaluated explicitly. In, the, in this case, the only contribution is coming from the, from the red stain, so from the, from the cross block, and it takes this following relatively simple form. Uh, okay, now now let's, let's, remi let's remember the important caveat that the, the kernel h of x, okay, so that, that in order that, that the functions are well defined when they act on infinite sums of blocks, which are bounded at infinity, uh, it is necessary that, that the behavior of H is sufficiently soft as X goes to one. So it must be bounded, it must be of, at most of order one minus X to the two delta psi. And uh, 
because we are expanding H in some polynomials, this, this necessarily imposes two delta psi linear relations among the among these coefficients a n. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in particular, the, the, the basis functionals omega n, which I just defined for you on the previous slide, are not well defined because because if I just because, because any any of the p because because none of the p n's is is bounded by is of order one minus x to the two delta psi as it as goes to one, uh, but it's it's possible to. It's possible to take very simple linear combinations of the omega n's, which are well defined. So the simplest one is written right here. You can you take m and n of at least two delta psi, and then you you can write down this specific linear combination where the first two terms, well, the, the the presence of the first two terms guarantees a cancellation of the of the of the coefficient of order two delta psi, and all the, and so the remaining coefficients are chosen. Precisely so that all the lower coefficients also also cancel, so they are fixed. They are fixed uniquely. So these these omega m and n are in some sense the simplest well-defined functionals. Uh, they have a they have a pretty nice uh, application, straightforward application, which is to to classify all all solutions to crossing with integer spectra where the spectrum starts at two delta psi. So so assume that you have a solution to, to crossing in the following form: there is there is identity, and then uh, all the conformal blocks, all, all, all the scaling dimensions, uh, set of integers, beginning at two delta psi. Then one can apply the omega m and n and use the, this orthogonality or duality that I mentioned before, as well as the action on f zero to to get to get the following equation uh, among the c's. So it, it only it always only includes two c's. And the only the, the general solution of these equations for for n and an m is a, is a one parameter family which linearly interpolates between the generalized free real boson and the generalized free real fermion. So, so the, the the most general solution of crossing with this particular spectrum is is of this form and a, a linear well, a linear interpolation between between the free boson and the free fermion. And then of course if, if you if you assume if you assume unitarity. Then this, the parameter which interpolates is just restricted to i in some in some interval. Uh, but what we would really like to do is to, to is to construct the extremal functional in this basis. So let's recall that the, that the function must lo look like this. There is a simple zero at two delta psi plus one and a series of double zeros at two delta psi plus other higher order integers. The action of omega. It can be decomposed in the basis as follows in terms of the action of the elementary function as omega n. And the action of omega n takes the form, which I already showed before, but we'll just, we'll just re recall it. And so, so how do we how do we find find the coefficients a, a of n corresponding to the corresponding to the extreme of function? Well, the, there is a number of constraints that the a n must satisfy. The first one I just I just mentioned. Uh, the the kernel h of x must be sufficiently soft as this goes to one. Then also also because uh, the value of the function omega at integer blocks is proportional to the coefficients a, we can we can immediately conclude that the that a where an index corresponds to to a zero of the function or to, to an operator in the spectrum must also vanish. So a to delta psi plus one and a to delta psi plus three etc are all zero. And finally, the, the most the most constrained the most restrictive constraint is the constraint that the functional has, has double zeros at all the at the rest of the spectrum. So ju just notice that okay, wh what do we have to do to get double zeros? We you already see that the omega n has has the sign factor uh, which has which already has simple zeros at at integers. So in order to make this into double zeros, we the the terms in curly brackets must sum to, to give we have another simple zero at those at those locations. So this will impose for for every double zero. This will this will give you one linear constraint among the a's. Well, I I, I unfortunately don't have time to to explain to explain all the details, but it turns out that in the end there is a unique solution for for the a of n up to a up to an overall rescaling which satisfies all these constraints. So there is a there is a unique there's a unique external functional. And these, in fact, these ANs can be fixed completely analytically, which is what I'm going to, to show you 
right now unless unless there are any any questions about the about the principles how to how to fix the ans okay it sounds like there are no questions so let me let me show an example of an extreme functional is it extreme functional so the simplest one is when delta psi is equal to one half so in order to describe the functional i will need to define some auxiliary functions let's define this function capital omega uh, it's, it is a meromorphic function of delta, which uh, contains in its definition its capital, function capital psi, which can be defined using the, the digamma function. And then the, the coefficients a of a n can be written in a closed form. So when n is odd, they are just proportional to the evaluation of capital omega at integers. And when n is when n is even, the a of a of n vanishes, which we already saw before because we know that the, the, the spectrum of the OP when, when the dimension of psi is one half uh, contains all the even integers. So, so the function must vanish at even integers, which means that a, a n when n is even must be zero. In fact, the, the full kernel can be, can be resummed or, or, or found in a closed form. So the, this whole sum of, of Legendre polynomials can be, can be found in a closed form. And uh, as a function of z, it looks as follows. Uh, one thing you may, you may be worried about is that the, the resummation of, of all the Legendre's produced an additional branch cut. So that there is this, there is this term, that there is this logarithm, which, which is a branch cut uh, for z less than one, which we, did, we did, which we did not expect, but it's possible to, to rectify this problem by, by, by deforming the contour a little bit. So, so, what, so the one obtains a a correct functional with the with the correct action, which is completely well defined. If if the contour gamma looks as follows, there is a there is a part uh, lying just on top of the branch cut. Uh, above the branch cut it goes one way, below the branch cut it goes the other way. So it only depends on the discontinuity of the of the kernel G of Z. And now this and an important point is that the discontinuity itself. Uh, goes to zero as z goes to one. There is this other. There is this prefactor one minus z, which, which is encircled in the in the, in the ellipse. It, it's, it's important that this, this continuity goes to goes to zero because uh, we need to make sure that the function in no way depends on the behavior of conformal blocks on the branch cut itself. As we know that the crossing equation does not con that, well, the expansion in the conformal blocks does not converge on the branch cut. So so we, we make sure that the the function is in no way sensitive. To the behavior there, and it's it's quite reassuring that that the full functional does not depend on the on, on the behavior of, of the yeah of the blocks at z equal to one to two sensitively. Hmm. One can go a bit further and Sorry, actually, yeah yeah. Could, mm -hmm. you, could you go back and explain the contour uh, again? Uh, I didn't yes. quite follow. So why yeah. are the uh, so you, you're going under the cut and then you're going back. It, it looks right, like, right, right. why don't those two cancel? Right, right. so, so in, in the, or, or originally, originally when we, when we didn't take a, an infinite sum over ends, the, the, cont the contour did not include the, the two pieces, uh, one, above, uh, one just above the branch cut and one below the branch. It was just this, this drop-shaped drop -shaped contour gamma. Now after, after one takes the infinite sum over, over all the pn's, one finds that uh, there is an additional branch cut forming coming from this infinite sum. Uh, but the, the correct action of the functional is reproduced. So, okay, so, so well, uh, let, let, me, let, me go, let me go one step back. So, so you, you, may, you may worry about what is the correct choice of contour, right? Because, because before, before this additional branch cut formed, there was no dependence on the precise location when the contour gamma intersects the real axis. But, but now, because the branch cut formed, it, it seems like it depends where exactly it intersects the, the real axis. And the, the way to, 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 to make sure things are well defined and consistent is to, well, is to add the, these two extra pieces of the contour. So if, if you add these two extra pieces of the contour, one just above and one just below of the, of the real axis, it means uh, z equals zero and z equal one. You, you find that this contour integral is going to give you the correct action of the functional and is perfectly well defined. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a bit technical. I'm not sure if it's, if it's super important for, 
for the understanding, but yeah, the, just the, the the message should be that if you take if you take the contour of gamma shown shown on this slide, you're going to find you, the, the, together with together with g of z just above it, you're going to find the this is the right functional. Thank you. Yeah, I can I can explain later and be a bit, a bit better. Uh, okay, so yeah, this is this is the action of the functional. Uh, you can see that uh, you can see that uh, we get a we get a series of double zeros, which are coming from from the sine squared. So the double zeros at given integers at four, six, eight, etc. Now at the delta equal to two, there is just a simple zero, which is coming from the fact that the double zero of the sine squared is uh, is cancelled by by a simple uh, supplemented by a simple pole of the of the omega function. And then at one, delta equal to one, capital omega has a double pole, so the double zero completely goes away. Now he, uh, I also I also made a comparison to you know, of, of the of the exact functionals to the numerical bootstrap functional. So the in a per, in a particular in a particular basis, I plot it both. So the the dashed lines dashed lines corresponding to the correspond to the exact uh, functional which which I just described on. Uh, previous slides and uh, the dots of the same color correspond to the to the numerical bootstrap functionals for ever increasing or for, for increasing n max. And, the, and, the, and the, the various the various series or the various colors correspond to, to, to coefficients of various derivatives or various functionals in a specific basis. So I, I think that it shows that. It, uh, yeah, the plot shows a pretty good, pretty good evidence that, uh, that the numerics are converging to the to the same functional which which I just found. And now, as I said, it's possible to repeat the same procedure for arbitrary delta psi integer or half integer. So let me just show you the, the exact solution when delta psi is a is an integer. It looks it looks a bit messy, but maybe no. hopefully you won't you don't find it too disgusting. Uh, one, one needs to define these two auxiliary functions, alpha and beta, and then then uh, capital omega is uh, is of, of the form shown on the shown on the slide. And again, a n is either proportional to capital omega for an even or zero for an equal to odd. And again, the the complete action of the of the extreme functional can be found in a closed form. Where now we have we have double because because delta psi is an is an integer the spectrum in the OPE consists of odd integers. Uh, this is why we have a cos squared instead of a sine squared. So cos squared is going to have uh, double zeros at at odd integers, which for low lying values of delta are going to be cancelled by by poles in omega. But for 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 high values of delta, uh, omega capital omega has no poles, so we we do have we do get the right structure of double zeros. So the, the existence of this functional shows that uh, two delta psi plus one is the is the optimal bootstrap bound on the gap. Now, of course, you you, you can be you should be asking uh, if, if these functionals are, are good for anything else. Okay, that they can be they can be used to show that uh, that the bound in one D in, in some relatively restricted problem is has a certain value. But you can you can wonder whether they could be useful for anything else. And it turns out that they can. Which is what I'd like to, what I'd like to uh, explain in the rest of the talk. So let's let's consider some solution of the crossing, characterized by by these by operators calligraphic O and their OP coefficients, and let's let's apply the extreme of functional omega with a subscript delta psi to the to the solution to crossing. I, I apologize that the, before I was calling omega omega with a subscript the basis functionals, but from this from this point on, omega with a subscript delta psi means the the extrema functional for external dimension delta psi. Okay, so let's apply the functional to the crossing. We get an equation like this. This equation is trivially satisfied when uh, when the theory corresponds to the to the generalized free fermion because the because the spectrum lies in zeros of the functional. But the, the equation gives you some some non-trivial constraint in in all the other cases. In, 
or on all other solutions to crossing. So it's it's interesting to to understand what this constraint is. Of course, at the at a completely naive simplest level, when we plot the functional, this equation just tells you that if the theory is unitary, we must uh, we must include some operators in the in the red, red region. Now, okay, this this is this is not as interesting as what I'm going to show you later. Uh, now, the what 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 I would really like to do is to take the limit when delta psi is much greater than one. The reason why this limit is tractable, or one of the reasons, is that the coefficients a n decay decay pretty fast uh, with with n, um, or the, they, they decay the faster the, the larger the value of delta psi. So the decay is that is of the order of n to the minus four delta psi minus one. So indeed, the fa the greater value of delta psi, the faster decay of the coefficients. And this makes the this makes the limit quite tractable, and we will find that there is a di direct connection. Th th these functions will then provide a direct connection between the crossing in the in a boundary CFT and scattering in in the flat space limit of the of the bulk ADS. The the first hint that something like this might happen is that the first the location of the first zero of the functional asymp asymptotically uh, that I found of these extreme functions asymptotically approaches to square root of two times delta psi. And the, this, this precise location corresponds to the to the point which is fixed by the crossing symmetry of the flat space S matrix. So, so not not crossing in the boundary CFT, but but the crossing symmetry of the flat space S matrix. So the, this yeah, this is some indication that uh, that the function is not about flat space physics. Okay, so let's just do a quick re quick review of uh, of scattering in in massive quantum field theories. Let's consider a, a massive point of view theory in, in one plus one dimensional space time. And let's take psi to be the, the lightest particle of this theory. And let's let's think about scattering of two psi particles into two psi particles. The only kinematic invariant of the scattering is this Mandelstam variable sigma of P1 plus P2 squared normalized by, by the mass of the psi particle squared to make it dimensionless. Now the whole the whole two to do scattering is described by by the S matrix, which is a function of sigma, where physical scattering corresponds to sigma being real and greater than greater than four. So the, the S matrix um, has, a, has a branch can there, and its absolute value is greater than is less than or equal to one. So the, this region corresponds to the to the production of of uh, out well, of two particle states out states. But uh, the S matrix also knows about about bound states. So the, the bound states uh, precisely correspond to to the poles of the S matrix. So they they can be in in the case when when psi is the sorry, uh, yeah I think in the case when the psi is the lightest particle this is the this is the full structure that we can we can have uh, a bunch of poles corresponding to the to the bound states living on the real sigma axis between zero, between zero and four, and so the S matrix has a pole at the at the mass at the mass squared of that pole, uh, at the mass squared of that, of that bound state, uh, where and where the residue G J squared can be interpreted as the effective coupling between the between the psi particles and the bound state. And that, then I also included this this factor calligraphic J of J, which is just some which, 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 just coming from some some Jacobian. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a positive function of mu. It's, it's not very important for the for the analysis. But uh, in fact, there is more structure than that, which is coming from the crossing symmetry of the S matrix. So the crossing symmetry just maps S sigma to four minus sigma, and we need to complete the whole picture by the by the crossing crossing symmetry symmetric uh, components. So there is another branch cut and then a bunch of bunch of poles uh, with, the, with the opposite sign of the residue. Now, what happens when we deform the flat space to to an ADS, ADS2, which is which is uh, quite which is large? The situation was was analyzed uh, numerically in a, in a recent paper by, by by the author shown on the top right. So, what 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 happens when we when we put a massive quantity theory in the in an ADS background, so that, so that there is no di no dynamical gravity in this case. It's important. Uh, so, what happens in that case is that 
we get a we get a one dimension we get, we get a one parameter family of one D CFTs defined on the boundary, where the scaling dimensions of, of primary operators uh, scale with the radius of ADS. They are proportional to to the mass of the corresponding particle times the radius of ADS, and the the ratios of uh, scaling dim of scaling dimensions of these primary operators just approach approach the the, the mu j. Uh, variables that I, that in charge of the ratios of the, of the corresponding masses. Now let's let's consider the OPE of the primary operators psi corresponding to the to the light to the lightest uh, particle of the theory. It will contain identity, and then it will contain two kinds of contribute two other kinds of contributions. There are the there are the bound states shown in blue uh, with the with invariant mass between zero and two, and then there are the two particle states, which are those which are those uh, operators where for which for whose for whom mu is greater than two. Uh, now, one one should one finds that the the flat space physics governs the, the leading order at large delta psi of the CFT data. So, for example, the OPE coefficient of the bound state. Uh, it's proportional to the to the residue of the S matrix, which is upstairs, is G G J squared. Uh, but most importantly, we find there is a there is an exponential factor, the, the last factor shown shown in red. So it's, it's V mu J to the minus delta psi. Uh, this factor is is really is really coming from the from the LSE factor of the of the particles propagating over large distances in ADS. So so we know that um, the amplitude of a massive particle to propagate over a large distance. Is exponentially suppressed. Uh, okay, the, so the, the 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 function v v of mu is shown here. It's rather complicated, but can can be easily found uh, from just from drawing geodesics in in ADS. In the in the region where mu is between zero and two, so for the bound state, it's always greater than one. So indeed, we we have exponential suppression. And uh, okay, the, now now the way that uh, the, that the flat space physics enters the CFT data of the two particle states is a bit more intricate. So the, the two particle states will, will correspond to to to, inf to infinitely many infinitely many operators of, of a uniform density appearing in the in the psi psi OPE. And if the if the theory is free. So if, if, the, if the theory is free, then they will just lie at two delta psi plus some integers. But but when the theory is interacting, this this two delta psi plus integers is going to be shifted to some to some other values. So now now the dim dimension of the two particle state minus two delta psi is no longer going to be an integer. And in fact, when you when you average the this phase it's e to the minus i pi with the factor upstairs over over all the operators with a fixed mu. You're going to recover the S matrix. So, so in this way, the S matrix again, the S matrix of the flat in the flat space enters the CFT data of the theory in large ADS. Okay. So now, uh, how do we make a connection between our functionals and the, and the flat space physics, as I promised? So let's let's assume that we have a one-parameter family of solutions to crossing in a in a 1D CFT, and of the form that where all the scaling dimensions go to infinity. With the ratios fixed to some some positive values. Now we we take the we take the solution to crossing corresponding to the four point function of psi and apply the extrema functional that I constructed in the first part of my talk. So we get an equation as follows. And we would like to we know we would like to study this equation in the in the lim in the limit that I described. So in the limit where all dimensions go to infinity. Now the first thing to to notice that the that the, the limit of the extreme of functional is pretty simple, and intriguingly, it's the, the extreme of functional when delta psi goes to infinity is exponentially enhanced exactly in the same way as as, uh, as we know the exponent as we know the OPE coefficient should be exponentially suppressed. So let, let me let me show let me show a picture of the extreme of functional. So we we know it's it's exponentially enhanced. So if we if we factor out if we cancel if I'm just going to plot the what is left after we we factor out or we cancel the exponential enhancement, we find the following structure. So there is there is basically no oscillation 
in the in the region in the region corresponding to the bound states. Uh, and as I already promised, uh, there is a simple zero for mu equal to square root of two. So this this is uh, sigma equal to two. So the crossing symmetric point of the S matrix. And uh, we we know that in the region corresponding to two particle states, there are, there are these oscillations with, with double zeros at various locations. So this this will this will this will soon be soon be important when we evaluate the extremal function on our solution to crossing. So let's first let's first think about what happens. Uh, so let's let's look at this equation. Let's look at the equation in the middle, where we apply the extremal function to the solution to crossing, and let's let's think about what is the contribution to the, of the bound states. Well, if we require that at large delta psi, all the bound states contribute at the same order, the p exponential enhancement of the of the extreme of functional implies that the that the op coefficients should be exponentially suppressed but of course because the overall normalization of the function is not fixed we can only we can only make statements about the relative op coefficients so this is what i wrote here that the op at large delta psi the op coefficients of of two states for, with mu between 0 and 2 uh, must uh, or must follow an exponential behavior of delta psi of the following form. So it, it's only a relative statement, but that is the best we can do. So now if we if we do assume that the solution to crossing corresponds to scattering of a local theory in, in large ADS, we can actually explicitly evaluate the contribution to the crossing equation coming from a single single bound state. And uh, using using the dictionary from one of the previous slides, we'll find that it's just the residue of this function. So the, the prefactor, the prefactor just comes from the extremal functional, and the S matrix comes from the comes from uh, the the C squared, roughly speaking. And when we sum the contribution of all the bound states to the crossing equation, we find that it can be written as the as, the, as this contour integral in the sigma plane. So we, literally, we are just we are just summing summing up residues of a certain function. So this is just equal to to the to the integral uh, with a contour encircling encircling all these residues. So that's that's all very nice for the bound states, but what about the two particle states? So what happens for for the two particle states is that because the theory is not free anymore, the two particle states, which are here shown as the red dots, no longer sit at the double zeros of the function. But because the the whole profile the whole profile of the functional is is known and it is roughly speaking cos squared. It's possible to relate this this phase by which we are off from the from the double zeros again to the S matrix. So re remember that remember that I how I, how I told you that uh, the phase shift of the two particle states is again related to the S matrix uh, in flat space. So when, when we when, when we do that, uh, we can find that uh, again the the contribution of all the all the two particle states to the crossing equation can be written as this. As the following contour integral over contour gamma two. Now I, I already used the the crossing symmetry of the S matrix to to duplicate a contour, write it both on the right and on the left. And uh, amazingly, we we find the, exactly the same if I exactly the same prefactor, the, exactly the same prefactor uh, in the contour integral. For the, I mean the, the the same same integrand for the two particle states as we found for the bound states. So in the end, when we put when we put everything together, the the whole the whole crossing the, well, the whole crossing equation at large delta psi can can just be written as a as a certain as be a certain equality where uh, a contour integral is equal to zero. So remember that that the contour gamma one was coming from the bound states. The contour gamma two was coming from the two particle states, and now there is a small subtlety which which I don't have a don't have time to explain about the about the gamma three. So the, the gamma three comes from a contribution of a of, 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 of other kinds of states, which at least appear in the in the boundary solution. But okay, let's I, I don't have I don't have time to to talk all, all about the details. You can you can see in my paper. But in the end, when the dust settles, the the crossing. At the leading order in, in large delta psi, uh, is just a statement that this contour integral vanishes. So it's just a statement that, that the analyst that the, the S matrix in flat space is analytic in the upper half plane. 
so it's, and, and, and this this state, this uh, property of the S matrix is believed to be true. Um, we, we managed to relate we managed to relate it to to crossing symmetry. Okay, so the, this concludes uh, the, the content for part of, of my talk, and I, I'm just going to to flash a few future directions. So, uh, I yeah, the whole analysis that I described uh, was relying on the fact that 2 delta psi was a, was an integer. So it would be, would be really interesting to, to generalize to, to other values of delta psi. Another, another missing piece, uh, well, another future direction would be to, to, to try to produce uh, bounds on, on a coupling uh, in, of, the, of the massive quantum field theories, quantum field theories in the bulk, which which are basically the same as, as bounds and OP coefficients of the of the boundary theory, but th this would this would again require us require us to, to learn how to put double zeros of the functionals away from the away from the integer points because now the extreme of solutions will certainly not be free theories in general. So yeah, so now one should try to try to adopt this method to to theories with less simple with uh, more more complicated spectra. Then I I've, I've been thinking about journalizing this. These functionals to, to two dimensions. We've certainly limited progress, and the, the holy grail would be would be to see what happens in Hardy. And then, then of course, there there are, there are other. It would also be interesting to 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 generalize this, this class of functionals to to more general bootstrap setups, such as one involving multiple mixed correlators, as well as uh, as well as the modular bootstrap. Okay, so that's that's all I wanted to say. Thanks thanks for your attention. Thanks, Dalimo, for a very nice talk. Uh, I, I believe there must be questions, so we have time for questions. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe it's a question for Dalimo, but also partially for uh, related to the comment of uh, David, which is, do you see now a better relation between uh, what you are doing and this upcoming work of Simon, where he inverts crossing equation and write C equal to some kernel acting mm -hmm. because it yeah. well I I do not I have to say maybe I mean maybe David has a better answer to that um, I I think uh, I'm not precisely sure so I think what Dolly Mill is doing is very closely related to the talk that Balt gave uh, several years ago, and that there are notes about floating around. Um, so I think so. You can study uh, the crossing kernel for SL2 blocks, and um, there there's this notion of uh, principal series representations and discrete representations. So principal series representations are representations where the weight delta is equal to a half plus i times a, um, a real number. Um, and for those representations, the blocks satisfy an orthogonality relation. Um, and um, then discrete representations are those where the weights are, are integers. and they also satisfy an orthogonality relation, but of a chronic or delta type. And I think what Dolly Mill is doing might be related to that, that d the discrete series, the orthogonality between discrete series representations. Um, and um, so in terms of the relation to what Simone is doing, um, there are some, so Simone's story is in higher than one dimension. Um, and Simone's story is not the same as just applying the one dimensional story twice. Let's, let's say in two dimensions where mm -hmm. the conformal group is just SL2 cross SL2. It, it's not the same as applying the one dimensional story twice. And, and instead, because if you did that, then you would write the conformal block expansion as a double contour integral, one in H and one in H bar. But in Simone's story, he doesn't do that. There's a single contour integral, mm -hmm. and then he analytically continues in the That's other right. variable. That's right, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I think I think I think Simon talks about talks about the, the, this is double discontinuity. So so what, so one important I mean, one important difference between what I'm doing and what he's doing, which is also which is basically well another way of stating what David already said, is that uh, the the integrals that that Simon performs or the, this functional that this object that he applies to the to the to the correlation function actually gives gives zero contribution when applied to individual conformal blocks. You need to you need to sum over all the infinitely many conformal blocks to to get a to get a non-zero contribution. Whereas my functionals are already non-zero on individual conformal blocks. So that this is I guess one one obvious way to to see the difference. But I guess yeah, it, 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 it's a, it it seems it seems to be something different. That's right. That's why I was asking about your contour because I was trying to understand if it was related to the double discontinuity or, or not. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So for you, you had these sine squared pi delta factors popping out in a few yeah. places. Mm -hmm. So in Simone's formula, those those are the factors that come from the double discontinuity. Basically, the double discontinuity just introduces sine squared pi delta everywhere. But for you, it, it looked like one of the sine pi deltas was in your functional, and then another one was coming from its action on the blocks or something. Is, is that right? No. Well, well, the, I, I think I think the the sine squared, well, the, the 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 whole factor sine squared has a, has a uniform origin. It just it just it, it comes it comes from the well, I guess what, I guess what what is what is true is that uh, that one of the factors. Sign is already present in in the basis, so in, in the in the basis functionals, and the other one only appears after you take the appropriate sum. So if I if I expand the functional into the basis that as I as I was doing in my talk, uh, yeah, the the, the that one of the one of the signs is already there for the individual omega n's, and the other one only appears when, once we fix the a n's properly and take the infinite sum. Over them. About how to. You, you can definitely also think about about, a, about one of the signs as a as a discontinuity of the conformal block because again this this contour the contour that, that uh, I was using contour gamma can be shrunk all the way to the branch cut of the conformal block and then it just picks up the discontinuity of the of the conformal block and again then the discontinuity of the conformal block is just is just a sign. Any other questions? So I, I had a question. Um, so you you say that there are some natural linear combinations, finite linear combinations of blocks that you can form, which. Um, uh, of 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 uh, basic functionals that you can form, which are uh, good functionals in the same sense as uh, uh, taking derivatives as a good functional, so you can apply it and so on. So uh, and also you can compute the values of these functionals applied to any conformal block mm -hmm. by an explicit formula. So do you have a feeling if we now were to do numerical bootstrap in which you would take as part of our basis normal functionals including derivatives and then another part of our basis these new functionals that you propose just blindly, mm. uh, what would be the outcome? Mm -hmm. Well, my my naive answer is, and it is an answer, answer of somebody who doesn't have like as extensive experience with numerical bootstrap as many other people who are listening, is that is that the the, the base of, of derivatives is really the most is the most efficient one. That e, that e, even if that somehow the, it, it looks like that uh, even though the, the derivatives live in the deeply Euclidean region, they are still able to reproduce. A lot of the a lot of the physics which resides near the near the z equals zero and z equal one point near, near the light cones, and well, it 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 could be tried to to supplement the basis with the functions which I introduced, but uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I, I don't have good intuition for that, but is there anything useful I can say? So w one important observation is that these basis functionals that, that I use, uh, they eventually become oscillating. And the only way that you can make them non-negative on, uh, on when acting on a on conformal blocks is to take infinite, infinite linear combinations of these blocks, or of, of, the, of the functionals. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so if, if, I, if I only take if I only take a linear combination of finitely many of these base functionals, they will always eventually become oscillating above and below zero. So they will they will never be positive for arbitrary for arbitrary delta greater than some critical delta zero. So that's an that's an important problem which the derivatives do not have. But could you fix that by taking some derivatives as well? I, I lost the connection. I, I could only hear the beginning of the, of the question. Um, could you fix the oscillation by taking some derivatives as well? So mm -hmm. uh, if you took a few derivatives and then you had one oscillating function, it would be possible for linear combinations to be positive. Yeah, that's a, that's a good idea, I think. I don't, I don't see a problem with that. But still, these, func these functionals or the action of these functionals is still pretty complicated. It includes this this, this 4 f3. I'm not sure if, if uh, well, perhaps, perhaps it, by in the end it's, it's not too much more so much more complicated than derivatives of conformal blocks. Yeah. I, I don't know. It, it should be tried, I think, in practice. So I mean, ideally, if I can express a wish, if you know, you say that your functionals have some magic properties, particularly for large delta psi, and ideally, uh, one could imagine, one could uh, hope that uh, there is some way to just using your basis of functional or some combined basis of functionals mm -hmm. to have a numerical analysis which converges to this linear line. Uh, mm -hmm much faster, I mean, independently of any proof that uh, you may or may not have, because in some other cases where we don't have a proof or for for, fra for non-integer delta psi where we don't yet have a proof, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, something like that. That would be very nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I agree. Uh, well, I don't hear any other questions, so then uh, I guess uh, we should thank uh, again Dalimil and uh, and until the next time that we program another seminar. Well, thanks a lot, Dalimil, for joining us. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Everyone, see you soon.